In the last two years, the N family has become close friends with me. Ever since their eldest daughter-in-law came to our Buddha hall to pray to Avalokitas Varabhatas Atva for bestowing them grandchildren, and later they and their sixth daughter-in-law acquired babies, the Ns have been coming to worship Avalokitas Vara regularly. Last year I ever predicted that their family would have three more grandchildren. My prediction is that their eldest daughter-in-law will be pregnant again this spring and come back to Canada to give birth. His family's fifth daughter-in-law and sixth daughter-in-law will also be pregnant and become mothers this year. All these predictions have been confirmed, and the whole N family was wild with joy. I became a consultant for the N family, and they often call me to ask me this and that, including what to eat, what not to eat for the fifth daughter-in-law, what to pay attention to for the sixth daughter-in-law, how to manage the little Tommy's cold, and I am pleased to reply. A man who has never been married suddenly becomes a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology and pediatrics, which is a fantastic story. However, his family trusts me in this way. Strangely enough, my general knowledge of healthcare did help them a bit. For example, in the early stages of the fifth daughter pregnancy, two doctors, at different times, diagnosed her as infected with rubella and advised her to have an abortion. The grandma called me to ask me about this, and my answer was, your fifth daughter-in-law is not infected with rubella, so don't worry, and no need to carry out an abortion. That is her first child. How can she abort it? It's a sin. It's murder. Don't listen to that terrible doctor to abort the baby. The elderly lady said, the doctor asked our fifth daughter to have her blood tested. Bought us at the fawn. Do you think it's necessary? I said, the fifth sister is suffering from food allergy dermatitis. It's definitely not rubella. Why bother with a blood test? She is already anemic. How can she withstand having three tubes of blood drawn? You must know this local laboratory, they draw blood relentlessly. Anyone who enters the door will have three tubes of blood drawn at once. Each tube is 10 cc, totaling 30 cc of blood. Actually there is no need for so much blood in the laboratory. At most 5 cc is enough, the excess is dumped to sewage, that's really a waste. Moreover, nowadays, AIDS prevails. Is the laboratory clean? I am telling the truth. I am worried the fifth sister, who is already suffering from anemia, will faint. The grandma told her fifth daughter, but the latter did not trust me, and felt more comfortable with a blood test. She hadn't met me at that time, and had little confidence in me, probably thinking I was just a charlatan. She finally went to the lab to have 30 cc of blood drawn. As I expected, she fainted after the lab drew her blood, but fortunately nothing serious happened to her. She sacrificed 30 cc of blood to get a lab report. Negative. It proved there was no rubella infection in her blood, and my diagnosis was correct. After that, the fifth sister began to believe that I could do tell diagnosis in my absence. She was also cured of her skin allergies by my vegetarian diet. From then on, the fifth sister also believed in me and Buddha and came to worship of Alakitasvara with her family. I often told the family, although doctors are good, they sometimes make mistakes. You should see more doctors and listen to more opinions from different doctors. Like this time, it is very dangerous. In case she aborts the fetus indiscriminately, is it worth it? If she made the karma of killing, she may not get pregnant again in the future. The N family became very convinced of me. The elderly Mr. N had decades of stomach ache, coming to me for diagnosis. I saw that his stomach was internal bleeding. Later, the doctor confirmed that he needed surgery. I recommended it had better for him to have a vegetarian diet. Finally, he was cured by adopting my vegetarian approach. The N family has healed many such trivialities through my vegetarian diet. Hence, they devoutly converted to Buddhism and were devoted to doing as many good deeds as possible. This is something that I take comfort in. I am very fond of the N family's grandson, little Tommy, a boy born to the sixth daughter-in-law. 
The year before last, none of their daughters-in-law had been pregnant. Grandma N, who was anxious to have a grandchild, came to my house. I advise her to worship of Alakitisvara and pray to the Bodhisattva, which she did. Then, last year, in 1986, the sixth daughter-in-law gave birth to this chubby baby. Soon, the first daughter-in-law also gave birth to a plump baby girl. Both these dolls are very cute, I like them very much. However, I am not good at holding a baby. I dare not hold the girl doll, only dare to hold the bigger boy doll. As soon as the chubby boy sees me, he always automatically stretches out two arms to me for a hug. When hugging him, I am so happy, and he likes me too. He would put his forehead on my forehead and stares at each other with me. Every time they come, I ask them to bring Tommy to play with me. When I am preaching, he jumps around in his grandma's arms, waving his little hands and looking at me, and aids me with the lecture. When I put him under the altar, he would crawl on the ground and pray with his little hands together, which is a very strange thing. Furthermore, another girl, the granddaughter of Mrs. R, was also granted by praying to Avalokitesvara. Every time she comes to my house to play, this child will automatically climb on the worship mat and bow. On seeing the Buddha statue somewhere, she automatically goes to bow to it. It's hard to explain that this is not due to previous causes and wisdom. This situation is the same as it was in my childhood. I remember when I was a toddler, I would automatically bow down and worship the statue of Avalokitesvara when seeing it, and no one ever taught me. My mother was unable to give birth at that time and prayed to Bodhisattva for bestowing a child. She never told me about it, but I knew since birth that I was born because of my mother's prayers to Avalokitesvara. I had a difficult birth. After an incision to open my mother's abdomen, I could be removed, and I had been suffocating for over an hour. I saw the doctors working on my body for a long time, and then I realized that I was supposed to enter this body, so I came back to life. I have no desire to eat meat and have been a vegetarian since birth. I have never thought of marriage and I don't like family life. I often return to the Chan temple in my dreams or under a Avalokitesvara. I often hear the sound of distant Buddhist temple bells and meditation singing, which comes from nowhere, as if appearing or disappearing. Usually, when the bells and drums sound, I have been already in tears. I'm not sure if other children who are acquired by praying to Avalokitesvara will be in the same situation as me. However, the strange thing is that these children and I are particularly close. Like little Tommy and R's little sister, they want me to hug them as soon as they see me and refuse to let go of their hands. Little Tommy wouldn't even be carried by his parents out the door and back to his home. This causal connection is really difficult to explain. He only likes me to hold him, kneel and bow to Avalokitesvara. The R's little sister did the same, and she crawled on the mat by herself, put her palms together and bowed, saying with her little mouth, Bow, bow. N's daughter-in-law prayed to Avalokitesvara for a baby girl, Chichi, who is not yet one year old and has just learned to speak a few words. To my surprise, the first words she spoke were no other than the six-word mantra of Avalokitesvara. Every day, she would recite the six words on her own. This situation is similar to my childhood. When I was a child, I often put on white bedclothes and sat in the middle of the bed, meditating with my palms together and chanting the mantra. In fact, my mother did not recite Sutra Mantra, and no monks ever came to our house. When my father saw me, he laughed and scolded me, don't pretend to be a monk. If you do it again, I'll spank your butt. When I was a child, pretending to be a monk and eating a vegetarian diet is a violation of family law, and I always had to be very cautious and did it secretly. When my father was not at home and my mother did not pay attention, I would meditate on my bed with my palms together and recite mantra, which my father called a mouthful of nonsense. 
When I was around three years old, I spoke every day with a neighboring girl of the same age in words that the adults could not understand. We both understand each other, and we talk a lot. I remember we talked about Avalokitesvara and other bodhisattvas, and we talked about the huge lotus flowers, the great ocean, and the golden light. In addition, we talked about the many chubby babies who are sleeping or playing on the lotus buds. We also talked about the magnificent and shining Buddha temple that flies by itself. Neither my mother nor the girl's parents could understand me, but the girl did. Some people suspect that I spoke Sanskrit, but now I still can't read Sanskrit or Tibetan. I myself don't know what language I spoke back then. It was a mystery after all, and now I don't speak that strange language anymore. But I remember very well the stories of my early childhood. I also remember fragments of my past life, but I can't disclose them because we are disallowed to mention them.